So uh, tonight we're going to talk about uh, living water. So we're going to stay in the uh, book of Genesis, uh, you know, like we discussed last week. You know, uh, when you're trying to get doctrine correct, man, it's all in the book of Genesis. He's he's telling us the, the uh, end from the beginning. All right. So we're going to do a Hebrew nugget. Uh, it comes from a book called A, a Cocktail Continental by Bruce Reynolds from 1926. Uh, in this particular uh, book, because it's, it's important because it's right after the Bel Belfort Declaration, and there's a lot of evidence of what the people uh, looked like in that region before uh, before the uh, Be Belfort Declaration started and, and all the immigration uh, came through. Uh, so in this particular book in, uh, from 1926, uh, they were talking about uh, the, the the people of Jerusalem and, and, and what they uh, a lot of them look like. And so I just read here where it says, and even Jerusalem had, has jazz bands and across the road here in the Holy City, you heard it. Yes, sir, that's my baby. And there are cabarets in Jerusalem and dance halls. And in your hotels, the sign said, beware of pickpockets. So when you go down to the uh, next paragraph, it said, there are Jewish money lenders here in Jerusalem with glass counters full of money out on the sidewalks. And there are Jewish Negroes in Jerusalem. They proclaim themselves Jews and worship in the synagogues. So there were a lot of um, uh, uh, Black uh, Jews who had never left the land. They were still in Jerusalem. Um, before and right after the Belfort Declaration. Uh, so it's been documented elsewhere that, uh, you know, they were planning on working with the people, but the, uh, the Black Jews ended up getting caught up in, in all of the conflict. And now most of the Black Jews are now labeled as Palestinians. So you look up Black Palestinians and most of those are actually uh, Black Jews. So that's a good uh, resource. You can, uh, there's a link to it here in the slides you can also download it from your old books folder so check that out all right living water so let's let's look at this uh living waters thing so we're, we're going back to genesis again and we're looking at genesis uh two and 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 we're seeing uh that uh you know it says that he had created all the plants and every plant in the field and that it grew and at that point he says in verse five that he had not caused it Yahuwah Elohim had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. So, in other words, there was there was no work being done by man, uh, so that the herbs would grow or anything like that. Everything was self sustaining. Most high everything had self sustaining, and then he said there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So it was self sustaining. All right. So when we look at this and we go down to verse ten, from that. Uh, comes a river out of Eden to water the garden. And he said, from thence it parted and became in the four heads. The name of the first is, is uh, Passan, that is, which comforts the whole land of Havilah, uh, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Uh, the uh, Belium and the onyx stone, and the name of the second is the Gion. The same is it that compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. And the land of the third river is Hittical, that is it which goes toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth is Euphrates. All right. And so we see uh, when we look at this image here, uh, you look on the left side here, you see this, this, this garden where this river uh, is coming out of, this river of, of what you could say living water is coming out of uh, the garden, going out into the rest of the world. Uh, so that the rest of the world can prosper from the waters coming out of Eden. It's a beautiful picture. So we're just going to look real quick at the uh, definitions of, of, of the, uh, because there's a deeper meaning to the rivers that's coming from out of Eden. All right, so it's coming out of Eden and going into the rest of the world uh, to make the rest of the world fruitful. So the re re first one, uh, Pisan, is, is uh, definition is to increase. All right, we're going to look at these a little bit deeper here in a minute. And Gihon means uh, bursting forth. And Hittical means rapid. And Euphrates means fruitfulness. So you got, uh, you know, you got these rivers that's pointing to uh, an, an increase or a bursting forth 
or rapid or fruitfulness. All these things are, when you look at them, this terminology that's going to be used throughout all the scripture because it's pointing to uh, the restoration of, uh, of, of the creation. All right, so when when Elohim created man in his own image and, and, and uh, in his own likeness, he gave them, he blessed them, and he said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. So we're going to look at this word subdue. So when we look at the word subdue, it means to keep under, to bring into bondage, to make subservient, uh, to dominate. So in order for there to be a, a command like that, there had to be something opposite of Adam and Eve that was there, something that they had to take over, something that they had to bring into subjection to them. And so that meant that whatever there, there, was, there was that was there, it was going to try to influence them as well, but they had to take dominion over this and the way they were going to take dominion over this thing is to take advantage of the fact that they got the uh you know the tree of life there and they got these rivers that's flowing out so everything that they need to sustain them is there all they have to do is just uh, stay obedient and 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 go about the plan and subdue everything under the authority that they have been given that was the plan. And so when you look at like verse 29, he said, behold, I have given you every earth bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, every tree and the fruit of the tree. All right. So all of these things are dependent upon the water that's coming out of, the, of Eden. And so if the water is interrupted in any way, that means that the life Force, that all of these trees and all of these things and all of the files of the earth, and all of the animals are depending on is also interrupted as well. So not only is, uh, you know, the, the position of Adam and Eve spiritually uh, setting, uh, you, know, you know, relying on his obedience, but it's also the, the whole creation then is, is, is there uh, depending upon Adam. Uh, so when we go to, you know, when we say the whole creation is dependent upon the first Adam, after the fall, we see the creation going into what we call a groaning or moaning. So we see 2 Corinthians 5, 2. He said, for in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. So he's talking about us as people, that we have a groaning in us, you know, to get rid of this sinful flesh that we're in. Uh, we want a, a body that doesn't have these lusts that we have. That's not pulling us in every direction. That's not distracting us. That's not causing us to uh, have attitudes and not causing us to, you know, go in direct opposition to our Elohim. And then in Romans 8 goes into even more details. And he said, for we know that the whole creation, the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together unto now. You know, waiting, it says, for the adoption of, you know, the sons of, of Yah. So in Romans 8, 23, it said, not only they, but ourselves also, which had the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to it, the redemption of our body. Romans 8, 26, likewise, the Spirit also helps us our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we are, but the spirit itself make it in a session for us with groanings which uh, cannot be uttered. So when Adam and Eve fell, the whole creation went along with it. The, the water of, of life, the water that was, that was the sustenance coming from Eden, that flow was interrupted. And was interrupted because of the disobedience. And so you have the imagery here that Adam and Eve themselves were, had a spiritual uh, water that was going through them. And that's why they were uh, overshadowed with the Holy Rook. And they had the Holy Rook on the inside of them. They were drinking from the spiritual water. And then you had the earth uh, with, the, with the natural water coming out of Eden. It's a beautiful picture. So keep those two images in mind as we move forward. All right, so we're going to get a little deeper because now we're saying that, you know, Adam lost that uh, position and therefore the whole creation it began to groan and moan, all right? So the rivers themselves, you, you know, metaphorically, you could say the rivers stopped. 
spiritually. So how then could the Most High go about getting the rivers restarted again? How could he go about uh, getting the flow back to us again? Because, you know, you know, we, we had lost that position. And so he did not allow us to eat off the tree, the tree of, of life anymore because he was saying that I don't want you to be able to eat off that tree and live in this sinful nature forever. So he had to get those. He had to find a way to restart those rivers again. So let's go back to the name of those rivers. Except we're going to look at them uh, using the Hebrew uh you know, the the olive bet or the alphabet as we would call in the American language. We're going to look at the olive bet, and we're going to look at the deeper meaning of those because the, this you know name of these rivers are prophetically pointing to how the Most High is going to restart the flow of the rivers back to us again. All right, so the first one, Pasan. All right, it's spelled uh, with a pay a yo ching vav. And noon. All right. So we've already looked at what the uh, base uh, of the root word means, but then let's go a little bit deeper and see when we expand the meanings of those words out. Is there a meaning that's flowing out of the song? All right. So let's look. Hey, uh, it's represented by a mouse and it's in a mouth and openly speak through the foolishness of preaching the words of eternal life. The youth, according to the words of his hand, works of his hands, as it relates to the perfection of the law, by whom they obtain victory through the crushing of their enemy by the Almighty Elohim and the testimony of Yeshua Hamashiach, by connecting himself to man's world of sin with an iron nail to wood, the wood representing the flesh, and bringing in life, activity, deliverance, and jubilee to those who were captive. All right, so we could literally look at these letters and come up, you know, and I'm not saying that's a perfect interpretation, but I'm telling you, that's, we're getting in the, in the arena of and being able to interpret what the Most High was saying that he was going to have to do in order to bring this river, these rivers uh, uh, back to us again. All right, so let's look at the second one. Uh, Gion is spelled with the gimbal, uh, the yud, the het, the vav, and the noon. All right, so let's look at what it says. So it says, like the camel being self-sufficient with his power, his water, his Holy Spirit within himself walks through uh, dry, dark places, sending forth that which is within in himself to lift up the benefit as a helpmate to his will. According to the works of his hands, as it relates to the perfection of the law, providing a new birth, giving eternal life, and opening a place of eternal protection by connecting himself to man's world of sin with an iron nail to the wood, the wood representing the flesh, bringing in life, activity, deliverance, and jubilee to those who were captive. <laughs> so these rivers, he's saying, this is how I'm going to bring life back. So he's pointing to himself and his work, even when he's talking about uh, the river. So let's look at the uh, Hittical. All right, it's spelled with a head, a dollars, uh, a, a kuf, and a lamet. All right, so it reads out, providing a new birth, giving eternal life, and opening a place of eternal protection, opening a door to the whole of creation, and openly speaking through the foolishness of preaching the words of eternal life while being led as an obedient lamb by the voice or the shepherd of authority to the slaughter as a blood sacrifice. All right, let's look at Euphrates. It's spelled with a pay, a race, and a top. And it said, openly speak through the foolishness of preaching the words of eternal life as the prince, the head person who has demonstrated the sufficiency of Elohim and the insufficiency of man, you know, which was demonstrated through the sign and the covenant of the cross, which occurred at a di divinely ordained appointment and feast day. <laughs> man, that's powerful. So he's telling us through the names of the rivers, the prophetic plan of salvation so that he can restart these rivers in our lives so he can start flowing again from that place in the heavenly realm down to us again on a continual basis 
All right, so let's look at this. So when you look at the at the body, and you go back and you look at the uh, it was what was going on in the garden and the river flowing. When we accept the plan that the uh, Most High has through His Son Yeshua, He puts the Holy Spirit back in us. So that's this is this picture, this picture over here on the right. So we have a Holy Ruach inside of our soul, and then we have a soul inside of our body. But it's from this place that we have then down the capability to start to get the rivers to flowing again. All right. And he uses language of warfare, just like he was using in the garden with Adam when he was saying subdue it. We've got to use what's in us to put things under subjection, this warfare that we're in. Uh, you know, we've got to start putting things into uh, a subjection. It's a fight every day. I know I'm in a fight every day just to keep these things under subjection. All right. So in Ephesians 6 and 11, he talks about putting on the whole armor. So he's talking war language that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of Elohim, that you may be able to withstand an evil day and having done all to stand. So he's telling us like he did with Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and then go out. And he says, subdue, there's opposition there. And I need you to use the rivers that I'm going to supply with you, uh, to you both spiritually and naturally in order to put these things under subjection. All right, I'm putting you in a position to where now the rivers don't have to stop flowing anymore. I I, I didn't fail like Adam failed. So my rivers are going to go. They're going to flow to somebody. The question is, are they going to flow through you? See, that's the question. All right, so John 7, he said, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Yeshua stood in Christ saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as scripture has said, it's got to be as scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So now he's using language. He's going back to the garden. He's talking about this river flowing again. And he's saying, what's in us? If we begin to believe on him like we should, like the scriptures say, not what tradition says, not what the Eurocentric church said, but what scripture says, then we will begin to have an effect where the rivers, just like in the garden, begin to flow out of us like it flowed out of the garden. All right. I see. But he said he spake. Uh, he of the spirit so he defines what that river is here that he's talking to so we can now go back to genesis look up those words and understand that what he was saying in the natural he was speaking in prophetic in a prophetic language talking about the holy rock and he said but this spake he of the spirit which they that believe on him shall receive for the holy ghost was not yet given because that yeshua was not yet glorified so he's telling us that we didn't we couldn't get access to this river until yeshua himself was glorified until it was verified that yeshua himself had 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 completed a plan that adam couldn't complete that now the rivers can start to flow again and when the rivers begin to flow again now he can put that inside of us and if we choose to believe on him as the scriptures say then out of our belly shall flow rivers of living waters and now we can give out those things from within us to other people and that river will begin to flow from one person to the next person all right so now john 4 and 13 through 15 he said you should sure answer and said in the hurry talking to the woman at the well He's talking about drinking again. He said, Whoever, whosoever shall drink of this water, shall thirst again, talking about the, the natural water. He said, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So this, this is that same language that being used in Genesis, uh, talking about those rivers, you know, bursting out and, and rapid and, you know, all these things, welling up rivers. He's using the same language to get us to understand what he was talking about prophetically, because I'm telling you the end from the beginning. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So now 
we understand that we begin to have this water springing up in us as we be believe on him as the scriptures say not not what our buddies say but what the scriptures say we believe on him he said that, that his testimony is the is the spirit of prophecy is what i prophesied about myself that when you believe on me like the scriptures say then out of your belly shall flow uh, these rivers. So what happens then when these rivers begin to flow, it begins to feed everything around us, right? And and now he begins to talk about being fruitful because when the waters flow, everything that's attached to the water uh, begin to be fruitful. And this is what he's talking about in Psalms 1. We go read Psalms 1. He said, blessed he that walk, uh, standeth not in the, uh, you know, the the, the, the counsel of, of the ungodly or, or, or you know, walking, uh, you know, the, the wrong way or, or sit in the seat of the scornful. He said, but the law shall be a, the, the light to him and on it he shall meditate what day and night. Then he goes on to say that it'd be like a tree planted by the rivers of the water. And he said, leaves shall not wither. And everything that comes off of that tree, everything he do, he said, shall what? prosper because you, you're, you're planting yourself in the rivers of the living water. So in Colossians, uh, when he begins to talk about fruitful language, 1 through 10, 1 and 10, he says that ye might walk worthy of you who unto all pleasing, being fruitful. In other words, the water is flowing in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of Elohim. Matthew 13, 23, but he that receiveth seed in the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Luke 13 and 9, if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. That's what he was talking about, uh, you know, and he was talking about the uh uh, the tree not bearing fruit and he says should we should we uh, tear this fig tree down he said i'm gonna give it a little bit more time pointing to israel and john 15 and 2 he said every branch in me that bear not fruit he takes away and every branch that bears fruit he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit then he's talking about abiding in him understanding that the rivers come from him abide in me and I knew, and as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except to it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. And he said, herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. And so we want to get to the point where we're believing on him, as the scripture says, so that out of our belly shall, be, shall flow these, these rivers of, of, of living water, spring of force. Uh, so that other people can be affected, so that others uh, can see uh, who the Messiah really is. All right, so how do we do that? We had to go by the plan that he established that he was going to be the one, that he was going to be the one to do that. And we saw that in the definition uh, of the uh, word to the rivers. All right, so we go through this process of in, in our lives of putting things under subjection. And he's given each one of us the opportunity then to um, be judged according to how we put things under subjection. How much am I going to use this river that he gives me access to, to subdue the things in my life? How much am I actually going to put into subjection just for him? Because we're fighting this enemy that's ever present. You know, we're in this flesh, we're fighting ourselves, we're fighting those that influence our flesh. People are coming from every direction, but scriptures say, really, we're not fighting the people. We're, we're fighting uh, a spiritual thing. He said, you know, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but, but spiritual wickedness in high places. So the spiritual wickedness in high places are using people to get to us, to get on our nerves, to cause us not to put things under subjection so that we don't gain the fullness of being fruitful. So we don't get the fullness of the reward that the Most High has for us. So then we get to the millennial period, and he's still talking about the rivers. And in Ezekiel, when you get to chapter 47, he's already uh, basically laid out the design for the millennial temple. There's going to be another temple uh, in Jerusalem. It's, it's going to be huge, and there's going to be one that the Messiah builds. 
All right. And he talks about this river that's going to come out of it. So I'm going to read Ezekiel 47. It said, after he brought me again into the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out. He's talking about this river. Issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward, for the forefront of the house stood toward the east. And the waters came down from under, from the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. Then brought he me out of the way of the gate north and led me about the way without unto the other gate by the way that looketh eastward. And behold, there ran out waters on the right side. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forward eastward, he measured a thousand cubits. And he brought me through the waters and the waters were to the ankles. And again, he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters. And the water were to the knees. Again, he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters were to the loins. The waters is just flowing out like it was issuing out, just like we read in Genesis. After what he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over, for the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. And he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. Now, when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river were many trees on the one side and on the other. Then he said to me, these waters issued out toward the east country and go down into the desert and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters were healed. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, which, whatsoever the rivers shall come, shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither, for they shall be healed, and everything shall live, whether the river coming. And it shall come to pass that the fishes that shall stand up on it from Engadi, even unto Engelglank, they shall be a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds, as the fish of the great sea, exceeding many. But the married places thereof. And the marriages there shall not be healed. They shall be given to Sodom. And by the river upon the bank thereof, on the side and on that side shall grow all trees for me, whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to its must, because their waters, uh, they, they issued out of the sanctuary. And the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. Thus say Yahuwah Elohim, this shall be the border, whereby ye shall inherit the land according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And Joseph shall have two portions. This is powerful. He's going to start this river again from the sanctuary to flow out. And everywhere this water flows, there's life. There's healing. And so he's showing us that the spiritual river that he has started, restarted, is, is, it should be flowing through us. I mean, we've got to grow. We got a lot of things we got to do. We got to grow. We got to learn more about him. And we got to believe on him as scripture saying, as we believe on him as scripture said, then out of us shall flow these rivers then of living water, giving life to others through our fruitfulness. Right. that's the goal without taking credit for the work because we saw that the, in order to get the rivers to flow it was the messiah that had to do all the work so we got to receive that all right then we see in revelation 22 the eternal heavenly river revelation 22 and he showed me a pure, pure river of water life clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of god and of the lamb so this is when the new city, New Jerusalem, comes down to earth, heaven and earth meets. And now we see this, this other pure river from heaven itself. This river of water life, clear as a crystal, proceeding out of the throne. He said, and in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare 12 manners of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of Elohim of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. 
and there shall be no night there. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For Yahuwah Elohim giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. This river that begins to flow. All right, so I hope that makes sense. Adam shut the rivers off. First Adam shut the rivers off. The last Adam restarted the rivers, and he wants this river to flow through us first so we can put things in subjection and we will be rewarded and put into our positions to take over the entire creation based upon how we allow the rivers of life to flow through us. All right, so that's it on that. So we'll open up the initial question based up on this lesson only first. After we get through with that, uh, we'll ask questions based on the question for, from last week about Carmi, and then we'll have general questions after that. So first questions will be for this lesson only, and then we'll get to this question that I asked last week about in First Chronicles 2 about who is Carmi, and why is this significant? We'll see what y'all had to say about that. All right, so uh, initial questions on the lesson. So I'm gonna stop my share and then we'll we'll open it up for questions. All right, so I hope that made sense. Do we have any questions on the lesson itself? <laughs> All right, so no questions on this lesson. The rivers of water, y'all, y'all, yeah. Okay, Marcus. How you doing today, Elder? I bet not, sir, Marcus. How you doing? That yeah, could be better. But I thank y'all for it. Um, so I was gonna say, so with the with the waters um flowing through us, that has to do with um how much we're willing to be obedient. Because you mentioned putting uh things into subjection. Uh and by that do you mean um I guess like things were things that we're not willing to sacrifice or kind of give up? If that right. makes sense. Right. Yeah. 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 Pretty much. You know, all the things that we're holding on to, either by our own ignorance because we're not searching him out, or things that we love more than him that we're just hanging on to that we know we need to get rid of, but we just like it. It's just some things that we that that, that are weaknesses that we just like, you know. And we had to accept that too and be honest about that. You know, and we had to start putting those things uh into uh subjection. Um it's a fight. It's an everyday fight. You know, I'm fighting. I'm always fighting here. Lately at work, it's been something just I'm fighting. I just I just can't get settled in my own self at work, you know, and, and I'm trying. So I'm doing, uh, you know, I've been fasting a little bit, just trying to, uh, you know, people coming at you certain ways. And so, but we, we have to fight th th that fight, you know, when it says having done all the stand. So what he does is he puts the Holy Ruach back in us when we accept the plan. And so now we have the potential then uh, to be, to have that overflow. But it, it, right now, if, if you're not doing anything and you have the Holy Ruach in you, it's sitting there waiting for you to keep drinking. At, at some point, there's going to be an overflow. If you just keep drinking, and that's why he's talking about if you drink of the water that I have, if you believe on me as the scriptures say, then out of your belly. But there's, a, there's got to be the process of us wanting to drink this. You get what I'm saying? And so then that's when, you know, at some point it begins to bubble up and begins to come out like a spring, you know, because you, know, you, you can only put so much in a cup and eventually it's, it's going to spill over and begin to flow out. And so we do that by constantly uh, trying to, uh, you know, bring in him and also putting the things in our life under subjection to him. Okay, so I want to also ask you another question. So what if at one point you were or did put those things into subjection and they seem to kind of like backtrack on you? And now you're having like an even more more of a harder time putting them into subjection because you also did mention how obviously it's, it's not a, a physical war but it's a spiritual war and how spirits are using people pretty much using people to get to us to not put these things on subjection. It's it's kind of what I is kind of what I'm dealing with um, at the moment. 
So uh, I just wanted you to elaborate on that. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, if everybody's honest, you know, we 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 deal with that. You know, we 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 you know we walk with him and it's things that we struggle with that he you know helped us put in his objection. You know, and I, I don't know if it's because sometimes we get comfortable with the power that we're walking under and when we get used to it and then we think it's us. And he has to remind us that it's not us. That it's him that's giving us strength and power to put those things in subjection. Uh, you know, or you know, it, it's something that happens there that we'll put something under subjection for a while, and you know, we get lazy or, or something. And he has to remind us that that thing is still there, waiting to 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 destroy you. And he has to show us that we haven't overcome that thing without him. And all of us have that thing. You know, I, I don't have to know what your thing is. Everybody in here knows what their thing is. It just keeps coming up. You think you got it under control, and then it comes up again. You know, and so whatever your thing is, you know, uh, you, he he got to let you know that he, the power is coming from him. And you know, this kind of goes back to what uh, why he gave Jacob a limp. You know, I need you to remember you you was always strong in yourself. But I need you to understand now that you got a limp, you can't depend upon your own strength now. If you're going to defeat your enemies, you got to depend upon uh, my strength. This is what he was telling Paul. You know, Paul said, I came to him three times and I asked him, you know, uh, you know, if he could take this, this spirit that's buffeting me, man, I, I, I need you to get rid of him. He said, no, I'm not going to get rid of him. He said, yeah, my grace is sufficient. Even Paul himself admitted that he could be arrogant. He knew he knew so much that he he could be arrogant at you know, at times. And so you know, when you have that much knowledge and stuff, he, Most High has to give you something to buffet you, to keep you from thinking it's you. You, you see, what I'm saying it's not us. It's him. It's the power that he gives us, and it keeps us humble. And so um, I would say, keep fighting. You know, once you recognize that this thing has come back up on you. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna go to him? Are you gonna try to fast and take it to another level? Or, you know, uh, you know, had never fast before. You know, well, he said there's something that you will never be able to get under control without prayer and fasting. Are we not gonna try to uh, uh, pray and fast and just leave those some things out there to that that, that we can't overcome? Y'all, y'all, y'all with me on that? If he says that there are some things that we will not be able to overcome without fasting and praying. And we don't fast and pray to try to overcome those things. We're not going to overcome. So, you know, and I'm not saying you have to do long fasts or whatever. I'm just saying we have to, you know, sacrifice 12 hours or 24 hours here and there to try to put things on. He, he's worth that, right? You know, most of us got a little extra body fat on. We can handle it. We, we can go a little bit longer than than what we think without uh, without some food. So <laughs> we'll be all right. Um, all right, any other questions on it? Uh, Al? Hey, good afternoon, Elder Shoulder. Shalom. Shalom. All right, all right. So uh, just a quick question. This is more of a physical nature. Um, have you ever looked at where the Garden of Eden was located according to those rivers, or do you feel like that's lost knowledge at this point? Uh, I think there are clues there, especially when you start talking about, uh, you know, the river that run all the way through Ethiopia and all that. That that to me seems to be pointing to the Nile. But then there's also a river that runs uh, uh, west. Uh, you know, I think it's, it, 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 it goes across Africa and it's it was at one point called the Euphrates also. Um, but I, I do think that there was a shift in, in, in some of the rivers and stuff when the flood came and so we we kind of have to uh we kind of have to uh you know do a little bit more research to try to figure out uh where they are but you know f f just from my research too i think that uh you know eden started um if you'll follow the nile all the way down uh i believe eden started down in that area and went all the way up to where uh, we look at modern day Israel now over to and included a lot of what Saudi Arabia is. I think it encompassed a, a, a greater area than what we're looking at. So, but then the garden itself okay. was, was actually in the north where uh, Jerusalem is. 
Right. Okay. Yeah. Because I was getting ready to ask that. Like, is Jerusalem or, you know, there's questions about where Jerusalem is located today. Um, you know, and I try not to get too into that because I don't really know what benefit uh, it would give me. Uh, to switch up the question a little bit, I did see a verse that appeared as if Eden is under the earth. Have you ever come across that? Uh, you had to remind me of it. I'm not, it, it's not clicking right off. Okay, no problem. Let me, I, I won't, uh, I won't stop here, but I'll, I'll shoot you the verse that I was talking about. Maybe we can get a little more insight into that. Okay. All right. All right. Any more questions on this list? All right. Good. All right. Well, I ain't gonna say good, but. I well, I do, I do have one more question. <laughs> since nobody else is going. So uh, I got lots of questions. So, all right, the, the you're talking about the the millennia, the millennial reign, and you were talking about that temple and that scene where Ezekiel sees Yahushua, uh, you know, building that temple. Now, is the, so that temple would exist during the millennium reign, and the people that you're talking about, who it says that they will reign forevermore, are those the people that at that point that would be serving in the kingdom? Because then there would be other people at that time in the outer darkness. Is that a correct way to understand that yes uh somewhat i mean because you know once once uh you should take over the kingdom uh, there's no more outer dark we have to look at what used to be the outer dark because then he brings light pretty much to the to the earth but um yeah uh, so he he's gonna rule over you know from jerusalem and the other nations of course we had to come in and, and and worship and then you know the uh the temple is gonna be huge um you know he's going to reinstitute the uh sacrificial system not for redemption or anything like that but just to teach us israel who understood the law teach us about himself through those activities and what all those things meant but uh did i answer the question or follow up follow up yeah, yeah, you did him. It's probably my misunderstanding of the outer darkness. So in my mind, I don't know why. I'm thinking that, you know, during the millennium reign, Yahushua is going to be ruling from Jerusalem. And then outside of Jerusalem, wherever the other nations are, there's still it's it's going to be ruled by Yahushua's laws. However, there's still going to be sinners out there because it does say in Zechariah that any nation that doesn't come up for the Feast of Tabernacles there'll be no rain on them. No, yeah, so, you're, you're, you're absolutely right on that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So so with that being said, uh, at the point where the millennium, right, where Jerusalem is established during the millennium reign, right, after that thousand years passes and then there's going to be a new heaven and new earth. So then the, the, the city where Yahushua was reigning from during the millennium reign will be replaced at that point. Right, by the heavenly Jerusalem will come down and the spot that the that the old Jerusalem is, is sitting on is it's the place where New Jerusalem is gonna come down and sit on. Okay, and then at that time there would still be existing a heaven above the earth. So even though the Jerusalem comes down and replaces the old Jerusalem, that's just gonna be for that city, but the rest of heavens will still be where the father dwells. Is that how you envision it? Right, and everybody's not going to be able to go in there. I mean, get to there because of you know that's the reward. You know, some people are, you know, uh, you know, you got the outer court, inner court, holes and holes. I mean, you you'll be on Earth. You know, some people will. You know, and that's that's their reward. You know, they're going to live forever, but it'll be on the earthly realm. And then you got those that uh, you know live in the city, which is the connecting. Uh, place between uh, heaven and earth and then you have the holies of holies which you, you go through the city and go into uh, the the area where the you know where the father is so yeah and that's going to be a, another huge area to explore for those who are rewarded with that okay all right i appreciate that uh i'm looking around there's no other hand so i ask you another um when you say out of the body will flow living out of their bellies will flow living water what does that look like today when you come across a person or how do we know 
that we're exhibiting that characteristic. Yeah. Uh, effective effectiveness is is one thing, but you know, but the, you know, my main thing is: Are we teaching what the scripture is saying? Are we actually teaching? what the scriptures say and anything that we can show that is being taught that's, that's not in scripture is impossible to get that river to flow from that mm. yeah so you, you you'll be able to tell you know if if we're both in, have the holy root and you can tell i mean it, it's hard to explain but you can tell when that river is flowing you can tell when is this is the truth and nothing but the truth and you're being fed by it, and, and it increases a you know a better relationship with the Most High. You know truth uh, intuitively when you when you hear it. Okay, so so that's fair. So I'm gonna link back to something Marcus said earlier. So he was talking about you know as we all go through the spiritual journey, or let me just speak about me. I feel like I go through peaks and valleys, right? So there's moments where I feel very close to the Most High. Unfortunately for me, usually that's when I'm going through bad times. Um, you know, when times are good, I feel like I struggle a little bit harder to connect with the Most High, even though I, I just keep forced to myself to do that. Now, is the is the concept of the living waters flowing, is that dependent on your peaks or valleys, or should that be something consistent? Well, I mean, that's a great question. Um... The more the more we walk with him, and and I think you know we all struggle we all struggle with it you know especially when we're we're trying you know when we're trying uh, that somehow he might cut me off because I made a mistake you know or that you know we 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 come up with these scenarios and what he's trying to get us to see is that we have avenues that when we when we do mess up or we we you know whatever you know we we can be quick to repent and keep moving along the same track that's really where he he wants us to be also in addition to that he would like to see us diminish more and more and more and realize just how much grace we're living under and and you know I, I do believe that's one of the reasons why he allows us to keep seeing ourselves when you study what how paul uh was talked about himself when he first started writing some of the books and i had to find those instances where he talks about himself so he would in one book he was talking about himself as being a sinner right and then uh, you know, but he didn't, it wasn't dramatic. He was just admitting who he was, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I was a sinner, you know, most high saved me, la la that. Then he goes on into his ministry later on, and then he increases that. Now he's about to die. He's, he's in prison. He's about to die. And he labels himself the chiefest of sinners. I mean, it's just like, I'm the worst of all sinners. So it's, it's like the closer that he got to the most high, the less that he felt about himself in the sense of him, uh, his own ability to, to do anything for Yah. He had to depend totally upon the grace and mercy of the most high for all that he is able to accomplish and for all he is and for all the power that he has and all these things. So the so the less that we, we start looking... Uh, at ourselves and thinking we're getting a check mark from the most high and just start most, you know, depend upon his grace and mercy, the more uh, we are empowered. Mm. It, it, because it's almost like we're keeping track of something. Yeah, I hope this makes sense. And, and we can't keep track of it like he can keep track of it because we're often sinning and don't even know it. Mm -hmm. and so that's why he talks about always keeping our focus on him and when he does reveal that we and show us something we're quick to repent we get the bread we, we get the wine we understand that he paid the price he did this for us and we're always acknowledging it's him okay okay that makes sense so 
so yeah, I get it. Things keep coming up, but we got to stay in his face about those things that keep coming up. And we got to understand that he, he didn't choose me because of those things that keep coming up. He chose me before knowing those things were going to come up. And I think I, we have a, we have trouble, all of us, just walking in that rest with him and being so confident that when we do mess up, that we can just repent easily okay. with him. Hey, Elder, I will say from my experience, and maybe it can help Al out, that uh, when I was sliding backwards, like on ski slopes, one thing Satan did with me is he snatched my confidence. And if he can take my confidence away, he knows that I won't come before my father to repent. So I, I, I do believe the more we stay away from sin, the appearance of sin, or just dabbling into little sins, our confidence will grow and maintain. Like I always pull up a resume because I, I, I relate to you too. I, when I'm going through it, I feel like I'm closer and I don't want to have to struggle just to remain closer to him. But I do remember to pull up my resume with him. And if he got me through that, he can get me through this. But if I stay consistent, I, I think I think Satan attacks my consistency a lot. Um, like, okay, I fast. I, I dedicate myself to fast for five days and drop the ball on day two. And then I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna eat this burger. But if 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 if, if I can hop it, he's such a faithful father where he'll say, Okay, you messed up, get up. But don't get him back in line, just get back in line. We, yeah, we don't yeah. have it. You know, yeah, what, yeah, yeah, I think so. that's powerful what you're saying because um, you know, sometimes we do mess up and we find ourselves back into something that we, we thought we had gotten out of. Mm -hmm. And the enemy talks to us so bad, or we talk to ourselves so bad about what we've fallen into that we're not quick to repent. Right. And and so then when we don't, when we're not quick to repent and turn to him. We're giving we're giving ourselves too much credit at that point. Now, it, 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 we don't even realize how arrogant that is. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mess. I can't believe. It. Then he's sitting there saying, "I can believe it. <laughs> I, I know. I knew who you were before. I, I knew who you were, and I still chose you. So just because you're in disbelief at how awful you are." It doesn't surprise the most high how awful you are. And so we so then we get in this mode of self, the self-pride or whatever. And then we feeling all bad and 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 to the point where you know it's okay to feel bad and, and you know the grieve Holy Spirit, and that's because that's what makes us realize where we are, but not to the point where uh you know uh the it, it was it indicates that we were self-reliant. I hope that makes sense. Uh, so, Elder, let me ask you this: uh, Do you think there's a thin line between conviction and condemnation? Right. Like one is holy, the the other is unholy. Yeah, look at look at David. What all he did. We talked about it the other week. All the things that David did in in progression to uh, even murdering uh, his his soon to be wife's uh, husband. Mm -hmm. That was a lot. You know, David, that was a lot. He was king. But before he could even get the words of repentance out of his mouth, Nathan told him, but y'all has forgiven you. Y'all see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, but the thing that we have to understand, too, in context of that, is that in the process of us messing up at times, we plant seeds that we can't do anything about. David planted seeds through that process that he went through. And, and most of I said, listen, as far as our relationship goes, as far as the eternal wise, as far as, you know, the, 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 the eternal relationship we're going to have and your place in the kingdom, everything's been wiped clean. But it's going to be hell in your house for the rest of your days. Y'all see the balance there? It's going to be, you're going to see the consequences of your decision from this point until you die. Like, like we have forgiveness, but we got to walk out the ramifications they, of our actions. They, they, you know, they ain't always going nowhere. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So we're going to have to eat some things. 
and eat them knowing still that even though I might not forgive you, brother, the most high can wipe that slate clean. Because, you know, I don't know whether Uriah's family was still mad at David when he died. But the most high had forgiven David. The most high had washed him clean. The most high had established his place in the kingdom. I could be still mad at David. But David's reward is not based upon my anger. Yeah. It's not based upon my unforgiveness. It's not based upon that. It's who the Most High has called him to be. So I say that to say that some of us have done things in our marriages. Some of us have done things in other relationships. We, we feel bad about it. We have asked that person to let it go on us. They don't want to let it go. But the main thing is, if you have went through the process of doing the things you're supposed to do according to the fault that you you made, then it's between now you and the most high y'all get what i'm saying and so even if other people don't want to forgive you that's part of the consequences move on doesn't mean that the most high is holding you hostage i hope that makes sense i hope that makes sense so yeah so he, he'll you know he's quick to let things go on when we have a repentance Period, but it's still we planted some bad seeds, then some of the seeds are gonna come up and sprout. And we just gotta deal with it. It also doesn't mean that the rivers, his rivers aren't flowing through yeah. us. Right? Mean, mm -hmm. you know, when we when we quench the spirit, when we cut it off, that's when uh we inhibit things, but it's it's not like he's turning it off. And that's the difference between conviction and condemnation. Mm -hmm. He doesn't turn it off, and and if we think it's off, it's it's really pride. Uh, that's acting in us that thinks this is our river to turn on and off. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And just because some people that you may have wronged or are offended won't drink of the waters that you have, doesn't mean that it's not the right water. It just means that you're not the one they're going to drink from. <laughs> Man, y'all get what I'm saying? So uh, don't be upset because people won't drink of the waters that's flowing from you. It's not meant for them to drink from you. Think about what you did. You wouldn't drink from you either. <laughs> but on the flip side, too, Elder, just how powerful the water is, because if you remember when Yeshua was at the well with, and he told the woman, uh, I got I got waters that you, you can have that you'll never thirst again. She got so excited. And with her background, she was able to speak to the whole village. Mm -hmm. And they came to see about a man. So just the power. Of just speaking truth, <laughs> you know. Right. Yeah, it's it's powerful, man. So we had to learn then, to, you know, to sum that up. And I think it's it's a great, uh, great analysis, great insight. Help us to see ourselves. Sometimes we're in pride, and we don't know we're in pride. But we had to learn how to be quick and 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 fast on our repentance and and, and to let it go. I understand there may be some consequences. Uh, to it, but that the Most High, if we're if we're if we're honest about you know and turn away from it, he he's quick. That's where it says he's quick. That's, ain't that what it said? He said the cleanses from from all. All right. So he's quick. It was one slow about it, thinking that we're keeping up with it. That we're the ones that you know. Oh, how could I have done that? And that's why Yeshua said, y'all need to be humble. When what's I that found, scripture? What's that scripture that says, as far as the east is from the west, mm -hmm. so far as has he removed our transgressions, our sins from us? Yeah. And he said when he found himself in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mar Mar uh, Marquise, you had a, a question earlier, did you? Uh, I did. It's... Uh, it's a, prof a prophecy that was given to me by somebody a long time ago, and I wanted to um, get an understanding of it because when it was given to me, it was nowhere, I was nowhere near this class. <laughs> so it's kind of like, you know, I guess it's time to ask. Somebody once said to me, when your water makes word, it'll make new wine. Is that, I'm trying to get an understanding of that. Could you help me with that? When your water meets word, it will make new wine. 
when it meets you said when it meets where yeah oh, okay yeah i think on that one minute okay yeah i mean you gotta answer it right now but you know if you email it to me or something like that just so okay. we get an understanding of um that okay yeah let, yeah send that to me and uh, uh yeah i pray on that see what, then, uh, what he gives some me. of the scriptures that you used today for this lesson it's probably the first time that I've heard it uh, explained this way without it being some sort of, uh, what's the word, monetary gain. Hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah, a lot, so, a lot of these scriptures are always talking about that. Yeah. Yeah, so. I mean, not, I I mean people interpret it to be talking about that, and it's just not right. Yeah. That's not believing on him as scripture say. Right. So when Keith, when whose water meets the word? My when my water meets word it'll make new wine. All right. Okay. So that's what I had to say. Just to ask the question. Okay. Yeah, just send that to me. We'll meditate on that. All right, Al. All right, so uh, I had a thought, and I just, I don't know if this is connected, but it's kind of teasing at my mind. So I, I wasn't looking at water in this way. So I think that this lesson was very helpful in helping me understand living water um, and equating it to, to what it actually means. Now, you also talked about how the natural was a reflection of the physical um, in this, in the, in the case of the Garden of Eden and the rivers there. In Revelation, when it talks about how the angel, how wormwood's going to come down and it's going to strike the waters. And then I think if I'm not mistaken, it's like two thirds of the water are going to be undrinkable. Is there a spiritual connotation connected to the living water there? Yeah, I, I think it's it, it both things happening at the same time because, you know, wormwood is really a, a, an, an angel coming down. Uh, you know, I think it's one of the angels that the, that the dragon is sending down. And so uh, at the same time that you're having the physical waters being bitter and unable to drink, you know, there's a lot of prophecies out there in, in the scriptures that say at that time that the uh, spiritual waters, the, the Holy Ruach will not be available. Wisdom will not be available uh, at that at that particular time, be very scarce. So you you'll have the the spiritual waters that people won't be able to drink of, and then you got natural waters that people won't be able to drink of. So I think that's an excellent uh, excellent uh, point. So with the people who are still on Earth during those troubled times, especially believers, I guess we'll because I know there's a, it says there's going to be a famine of the word, and we talk about how the Most High's Ruach is going to withdraw itself from the earth what would happen to believers at that time uh do you feel like there'll be a change in their ability uh to kind of feel close to access to ruach in the same ways or will it be different for believers yeah that's a great question too so this is this is uh all right this is what's going to be happening all right so you have believers who are believing kind of wrong right now uh, if if that makes sense there he is but the belief system is kind of and it really needs to be polished up a little bit mm -hmm. so this is the purpose of the tribulation period to shake people and begin so that people can he is his people can begin to know the truth you know what i'm saying so uh it's kind of like the woman at the well experience you know uh you worshiping but you know not what you worship but i, I gotta get this right because i'm trying to prep you to enter into uh, my presence. I'm trying to get you right. So he gets, he starts the tribulation period and he begins to shake every, everybody uh, pretty much to their core to get their attention, to get the worship right. All right. So he, he does, he does that and he's, he's withdrawing his spirit at the same time, but he's revealing himself to uh, uh, more to his believers. All right. So as they believe on him, because the withdrawing of the Holy Rug is happening, that doesn't take away the consequences that will will happen to them. They're going to be starving. They're going to, you know, they're going to have to trust them when they're hungry. They're going to, have to trust them when when they're being slaughtered. They're going to, have to trust him in a whole lot of situations. You're still Yah, though you slay me yet, will I 
trust you situation. So it's not going to be an easy time. You know, it's, it's going to be a time where people have to say, I still trust you anyway. I'm not with you for what you're giving me now. I'm with you based upon the promise that you have made to me. I hope that makes sense. So this is that what that period goes on. So after the first part of that goes, then uh, he he almost he completely almost withdraws the holy rook. So by the time you get to the hundred and forty four thousand, the holy rook has has been almost completely withdrawn, except for when he anoints the hundred and forty four thousand. These are the only ones that's going to be uh, have that anointing and will be protected. Notice I say anointed and protected, anointed and protected. They can't nobody kill them. Everybody who else who accepts this after that, you know, they can be killed. They can be beheaded. They can be slaughtered because they don't have that anointing that the hundred and forty four or that protection that the hundred and forty four thousand have. All right, so there's still going to be some great slaughter, but in the midst of this great slaughter will come repentance and I'm trusting you even if I die. And that's showing the world and showing Yah that you have given up this life for the next, that you were willing to say, I know I'm going to die for accepting this plan, but I'm going to accept it anyway. All right, so that's where that's going to be. I hope that makes sense. It it does make sense. And then uh, I'll go. It, it looks like I think Marquise has his hands up. So I'll ask you another question after Marquise. Okay. Uh, Marquise? Yeah, um, I just read this yesterday. And I was kind of um, willing to ask this question. In Revelations chapter 16, it's like when you start reading Revelations, you start one way and you just keep going and going and going. And you'd be like, wow. How come nobody ever talks about this? So um, I ended up in chapter 16 where the angels, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Okay. When the angels start pouring out the veils upon the earth, mm -hmm. um, I have two two questions, actually. Okay. And it's like um, in chapter 16, specifically when the angels start pouring out the veil, the second angel pouring out the veil upon the sea, and it became at, uh, chapter 3. Um, chapter 16, verse 3, and the angel, second angel poured out the veil upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. Is it saying, like, physically in the sea or, like, in ships? That's one. Two, I see, like, a bunch of pride a lot in here because, like, the people have to drink. They can't drink water because it's, like, blood um the sun is scorching them and they still blaspheme the name of god because then they're repenting not so is, is that pretty accurate yeah I, th I, I believe so because once you hit get to the uh bowls uh it's transitioned now into it's gotten to a point where everybody that uh he's going to protect is protected so you have people that are alive that have uh, probably received the mark or worshiped the image of oh, yeah, yeah, stuff like yeah. that, that just flat out, no matter what happens, no matter will what not happens. repent. Mm -hmm. And they're still blaspheming God. Yeah. And that's that's when, and that's why the scripture is so important in Ecclesiastes when he talks about there's a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war, a time for peace. Because he's going to transition, because there's going to be a clear line of distinction made right. between who's his and who's not. And he's going to go back to the mentality that we had when we were going into the promised land. These are not mine. Everything that you see in this city, kill it. <laughs> see, we don't we don't talk about that side of the most high. Because but see, that would be an abomination. Mm -hmm. I was reading um, something. I was doing a doing a study of the word abomination, and it's like something that's not a, not a miscreation or something that's not created of God is an abomination. Mm -hmm. And so by that time he's gonna he's he's made a, a line of stink between that which is is the abomination and that which is not. And so he talks about it, and we've talked about it before in the prophecies where he says, I'm gonna I'm gonna use Israel's hand to destroy these people. And so we're gonna go into battle as well. He's gonna be with us, and by his power, we're gonna slaughter 
those who just will never ever refuse to be him the abomination and so that's when the he goes from the time to a peace to the time to kill it's the time for everything so yeah so second, by, i'm uh, sorry yeah i'm sorry yeah so i was just gonna say by the time we hit revelation 16 that line has been drawn but go ahead my second question was this uh, like i said i was reading it i don't know where i started maybe like chapter five or eight or something like that excuse me close the door and i just started reading through like more and more but something i never really paid attention to i can't say i haven't seen it but i never paid attention to until yesterday um everybody talks about of course the mark of the beast and the number and uh the mark on their hand or forehead but something stuck out yesterday when i was reading and that's chapter 13 verse 16. of course it says and it caused all both small and great rich and poor free and bond to receive a mark on their right hand and on their forehead 17. it says and no man might buy or sell save he has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name so that's or like um, you're kind of breaking you know, up on the re could you repeat that last and, part uh, 13 17 it says I'm sorry 16 and he caused all both small and great rich and poor free and bond to receive a mark on their right hand and on their forehead and then 17 says and that no man might buy or sell save he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So it's like when I was reading it yesterday, I was asking questions to God, just meditating on it. I was like, so you may not even have to have quote unquote, the mark of the beast, but you can still have his number or his name of the beast. Yeah, it looks like this is some type of identification system. Yeah, he's going to allow three of of three forms that is going to be allowed for you to have to identify yourself that you're with them. Right, and if you keep reading, it says like uh, you know, like you said, when the slaughter starts coming and Christ comes back, you know, they're killing pe people are being thrown into the lake of fire and stuff like that and being killed, and it's like uh, people who worship the image. People who have the mark worship the image of the beast and blaspheme God. So that's what I was reading yesterday. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's uh, that's true. And uh, you know, think about it. You know, that's that's a lot of things gonna have to happen before the mark. That's why I'm not as worried about the mark. I'm I'm worried about my you know my spiritual condition right now because I know that there's so many things that's gonna lead up to that mark. Uh, but yeah, that's a great point, though. Um, all right, uh, we'll get, we'll get Jonathan, and then we'll get back to Al, and then we're gonna hit that question that we 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 brought up earlier. All right, Jonathan. Um, I just want to backtrack a little bit, just because like it, it stood out to me, um, and it's something that personally, like, I, I mean, I think a lot of people deal with it, but it's something that I've dealt with as well. Um, um, and still deal with where like you know that arrogance kind of comes in, and you you um you feel like you're at a certain place and you fall backward. Um, and, and you're just like, I can't believe I did that. And, and it's helpful that you were just like, well, you know, I was like, well, I can believe it, um, but, but my grace is sufficient. So, um, and, and you've already been forgiven. So, um, but scripture talks a lot about shadows um, and how, how you uh, laws and statutes are, are shadows um, of heavenly things and, and, and things to come. So, uh, my question uh, is, when we find ourselves in those situations where we're feeling really down about ourselves, um, I understand that, that, that you just come in and, and he's fulfilled a lot and um, that he is, um, he's, I mean, you know, he is, is, is the object um, or the centerpiece of our salvation and he's the centerpiece of our forgiveness. Um, 
but should we continue to look at you know the shadows as well um you know to kind of help to i i guess like solidify our confidence or or is or are, are we strictly supposed to focus on him or, or is it a, is 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 it both in conjunction or um, I, hope, I hope that makes sense so when you say look at the shadows yeah, yeah hit me hit me a little deeper on that because i'm trying to make sure i get the right content so like um you know in, in previous lessons like you've explained like certain certain shadows of like things that are like in the law of moses and things like that so like the tabernacle being the shadow of heaven again and uh well, that's one in particular so like you know obviously that helps us to kind of have an understanding of like uh what's to come and things like that but um i mean i'm sure there are tons of other instances where he's pointing things out and casting shadows for us to kind of understand exactly what uh he's trying to uh uh teach us uh about ourselves and about um about him uh being our focus um so when we find ourselves in situations where like our faith is kind of shaken because of mistakes that we made should we still continue to kind of look at those shadows as like confidence as well like we understand that you know like um that our forgiveness and that the way that 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 living water in particular um comes through through your ocean but at the same time like should we look for those should we still be looking for those shadows to help to like uh solidify that confidence as well yeah um, trying yeah. To, like, I, I think okay. so and i say it like this you know you know like we in, we find ourselves in a position where we we messed up the whole uh system was set up uh, like this and so we see the shadow understand that this is what we're supposed to be doing we don't do it with the animals but we're still supposed to be doing it with Yeshua so if I find myself messing you know I messed up or whatever the the pattern back at that in the day we, we were to take our what we messed up on and confess that on a, a sacrifice or animal a perfect animal without spot without blemish because there had to be a substitute remember substitution and we would confess that on that animal or whatever. And then the animal would end up being slaughtered. And so the idea was uh, was uh, it was of substitution was, you know, that that you ended up getting the innocence of the, of that the of the sacrificial animal and the animal ended up taking on the the uh, the mistake that was made. Right. So that's the shadow. But we're in the reality now because Yeshua is the animal. He's the lamb. He's the goat. He's the bullock. He's he's that. So we still have to, we still have to uh, be diligent enough to confess these things on Him. That's the whole purpose of communion. He's just not going to just give us this this out to where we don't even have to talk to Him about it. That we don't even have to confess it to him. That's the whole purpose of communion. Confess it. Put it on him. Say, I realize that you're the one who paid the price. You're the one who did it. I'm putting it on you. I want what you got to put back on me. And then we 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 move on. But a lot of us don't even do that. So the shadow is trying to teach us how to approach our Messiah. I hope that makes sense. Y'all, that makes sense? The yeah, approach, makes so, yeah, so the approach that we're supposed to have as, as as believers on him for everything is that even when we make the mistakes, we're supposed to confess those on him as if he was, in the Old Testament, as if he was that animal. That's how we're supposed to do it. That's, that's what communion is. All right, so that's why he says in First John, he said, if we say we have no sin he said we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us if we confess our sins watch this he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we say that we have not sinned we make him a liar, and his word is not in us Y'all, y'all with me? That, that, man, that's so powerful. If I sit up here and act like I hadn't done anything, we make him a liar. Because he said, I 
went through hell because of what you did. And now you're going to sit up there and have arrogance if you don't have anything? I'm not in you. So this re realization that we do have these things it's the approach that we need to take that I think we fail at a lot because when we realize that we've messed up and we have shortcomings, we need to confess those things on him, the bread and the wine, and, and, and acknowledge that he took this. It was him. And the only reason I have right to stand in before him is because of what he did, and he's, he said he's just and faithful. But we have to take the step to confess it and say, I did this. I messed up. That's the step that he wants us to take. All right, that makes sense. Okay, so, um, all right, so did anybody, um, let me pull this back up and then we're going to get ready to get out of here, I reckon. Anybody, um, Got any information on the question? But, I had one more question before uh, you moved into that. Okay, yeah, 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 go ahead. Yeah, so, all right, I was, it's kind of a two-part question. So I guess the first part of it, I'll, and then I'll flow right into the second. So when we read about water in the scripture, uh, moving forward, um, is there just a, uh, implicit you know obviously you have to look at the context but is there implicit reference to the ruach is, like is that how you we're translating r r living water yeah because that's how that's how you should uh, defined it so like like here he said he said uh in the last day that great day the feast, you stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He believeth on me on the scriptures. He said, Out of his belly shall flow what rivers of living water. All right. So he's referencing back to Genesis. But when we get to verse 39, he, he explains it. He said, But this spake he of the spirit. So the rivers mm -hmm. of living waters that he's talking about is the spirit. So he's defining that himself. So it's not anything that we have to have too much conjecture on. He, he's defining it. And so, and and he's also talking about the, you know, getting back to the point where that it's always there. It's always bubbling up. It's always, you know, it's flowing. You know, whereas after we messed up, you know, we have to, we have to be in a point uh, with him where he talks about the form and the latter rains because there's not a constant flow. And the only way that he could flow with Israel with the crops and with the things like that would be that if Israel stayed in this constant obedient state, and then if we didn't, then the rains wouldn't come. Mm. All right. And so, you know, so we had to look at those things. The water is still representing that, uh, you know, but he's trying to get us back to the point where it's a constant flow of water that we don't have to depend upon the form and the latter range. We've got a constant river flowing uh, through us. Okay, so that, that makes a lot of sense. I've been reading Isaiah, and I came across uh, this verse that says, when the poor and needy, this okay. is uh, chapter 41, verse uh, 17 and 18. Can you hear me? I don't yeah, know I, if I broke up there. No, I got you. Okay. Um, it says, when the poor and needy seek water and there is none and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Most High, will hear them. I, the Elohim of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers and high places and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. So now when we jump into the New Testament and we see the question of baptism, in the question of baptism, is it referencing both the physical and the spiritual, or is it truly representing the spiritual and then the physical is more like something that we could do just to memorialize it when it says that we need to be baptized. Yeah. Yeah. So the, so when we, when we start talking about the baptism, he said, you're baptized into the body by the spirit. So the, everything is pointing to the spirit. So we, we have a spiritual uh, and he talks about the washing of the water by the word. So that means that we, we constantly need to be washing from the from the effects of this world on a daily basis, washing of the water uh, by by the word. 
and also those scriptures that you read, I think was it was Isaiah. He's showing what's happening on earth because of the connection now that we have from the heavens. So because we have a spiritual, what's happening in the heavens is now happening on earth. Water is flowing. Everything's becoming fruitful again because now we are fruitful again with the most high. You see, so when Adam became unfruitful with the most high, the world became unfruitful with the most high. You, you see the connection there? So it has to be what happens in heavens and begin to happen on, on earth. But it has to be spiritual first before it becomes physical. Okay, that makes sense. So with that said, and I know that this question has come up before in this group. Uh, so, so when you want to go get a physical baptism, let's say you've just been baptized in a denomination or something like that, because let's say that at the time you were baptized, you weren't fully aware of the truth of the gospel. You know, you were on your way, but you weren't there. Um, after you do come into the word and the most high gives you more understanding, do you feel like that Maybe not you know, maybe it's not necessary, but do you think it's a good thing to go and get rebaptized um, by somebody that you consider having understanding? Or is it more like, hey, make sure you wash with the word, make sure your spirit is right with the most high, and you know, all the rituals and stuff, that's not as important. Well, um, you know, the, the first act of obedience, of course, after you have the spiritual baptism is the is the water baptism. Uh, and then, you know, we, when we understand it, and I think we did a whole lesson on this. When we started talking about baptisms, we're talking about washing. So the scripture uses the plural talking about baptisms. All right. So you're baptized one time into the, uh, you know, when when by the spirit to become part of the whole but then there's a then you have the baptisms of washing to to keep yourself pure so you can grow in that it's a, it's a difference once you're in you're in but then you want to grow in it and become you know fruitful uh so it's it's, it's the idea of baptism we talked about the mikvah you know and that's what our people did we mikvah we, we washed all the time that's you know and even that you see it in our spirit we're always washing our hands we're always doing things to wash uh but there's nothing wrong if the form was wrong if you felt like the form was wrong and you didn't understand there's nothing wrong absolutely nothing wrong with now going and and saying you know uh as long as you're understanding that you're you're doing it uh out of respect for the for not having you feeling you're not having done the right form it's not a salvation issue it's just that you want to honor the most high mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with honoring the most high in that but but don't it, but if you think that your salvation comes from that then you're on a whole different path got you okay i i think i think after this lesson i might have to go back and look at that baptism lesson again because it feels like the, the living water and the baptism to me seem very connected. Yeah, they are. They are, you know, because you, you know, that's why, you know, when he died on the cross, they were, you know, out of this side came blood and water. So it's the blood that, that cleanses you to the point where now the Holy Ruach can come live in you. So there's the baptism basically or the washing or the sprinkling of the blood that washes you clean to get you to be part of the body. And then you're washed, you know, uh, by the holy rook into uh into that body so it's, it's a combination of that but you don't have to go back and get the blood again once the blood brings you in you're, you're in you're not you don't have to keep uh getting the you know the blood sprinkled on you you're you're in at that point you know crazy you get what i'm saying so, so that's why he only mentions the water so many... yeah, yeah i was saying i've seen so many arguments over this like people fall out and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, it's going to continue to happen because, you know, because you go read, read the book of Revelation and people are proclaiming, uh, you know, they're, they're saying that the, about the blood of the testimony and they're talking about, you know, they, you know, they were they're you know, they're rejoicing because of the blood that he shed and the testimony of that. So what what is our faith in? Is our faith in 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 the water? Is our faith in the work that uh, Yeshua has done? The water is the is the act of, uh, and we we we'll, we'll we'll we may have to talk about that a little bit more, but you know 
that's why I say the simple, the simple um, idea of trusting the work of the Messiah is 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 crucial because then we because we get into the idea of trusting ourselves when we get into these uh, type conversations. Right. I don't want to prolong the conversation, but I've seen people in my life who physically couldn't get baptized, you know, do it. They were sick or ailments and stuff like that, you know, but it's not like they didn't accept Christ as Lord and Savior. But for whatever reason, they physically couldn't get baptized, you know, so that doesn't mean they weren't saved. Yeah, I mean, you go to the book of Acts, man, and there were people, and that's why most I did that way. They were, you know, and I think even was it Cornelius? He already had the uh, Holy Ruach by the time that uh, the, uh, the disciples or the apostles got there. And so they were like, well, I mean, we can't deny the man the water. He's already in the body. So then they baptized him with the water. He had already received. So there were some people that didn't receive the Holy Ruach until after the, they got in the water. And then there were some people who had received the Holy Ruach because you know y'all was wanting to give the testimony that they they were his already. You can go through the ritual of the water, but there he that he already has the spirit, and they would recognize that and they would say, you know, well he's already he's he's, he's already in the body. We, we can do the we can do the water. So whatever philosophy you come up with, a uh, doctrine that you come up with, it's got to line up with all the scripture. That's all I'm saying. So you gotta ask yourself, how did this man be saved? And he hadn't been baptized yet by the time that the they got there. It, it's questions yeah, like that you gotta answer. If you're gonna come up with a, a different doctrine, you gotta answer all those questions. Now, yeah, I'm not saying y'all, I'm just saying in general. Yeah, the shows. I didn't mean to cut you, but I always ask those people about the thief on the cross. Yeah, you got the thief, and like you said, you got the, I think it may have been Cornelius. You know, they had received the Holy Rug before. So you you always got that. And then you had some who had been baptized by John's baptism, but they still hadn't received the Holy Rug. Why? You know, because they hadn't believed on Christ like they were supposed to believe in order to receive the Holy Rug. Anyway, um, that's a whole nother discussion. Uh, hey, perhaps if uh, if you um, if you're led to talk about this more, maybe Hebrews 6 and 1 and 2 would be a helpful scripture for us to, to look at as well. And it talks about moving on um, and leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ and going on to perfection. And one of the things it talks about is not laying again the foundation of the doctrine of baptisms. Mm -hmm. So that, that might be something that be would be help contribute to the conversation. Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent yeah. Hebrews 6. 6 and 1. Boy. So yeah, so check that out. But yeah, what it, you know, when we come up with things, it's got to apply universally. Yeah. All right. Um, so we'll get to this last question. And Elder, real quick, um, how, how how deep this is? We probably on to something because, like, like yesterday was said, there was two baptisms. There was the baptisms of, of John, and then there was the baptism of him. And then as holy as this is, this is Yah wrapped in flesh. Why would he let a sinner like John baptize, baptize him? Uh, then you, like, get into, how, you, get in, you get into the mode of baptism at that particular <laughs> point. And it's different than what we see today. They didn't touch each other during the mikvah. You know, mm. they did monitor the situation. We, we go back and listen to that lesson about baptism. They, we didn't touch each other during the baptism. So, um, it, you know, so that's that that would get into that discussion. But when John said, you know, I'm baptizing you with water, but there's one coming who's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. What does that mean? Which one do you want? The Holy Ghost and fire or the water? If Yeshua is baptizing you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Everybody got to answer that question. Oh, I want the water. I just want the water. Okay, well, he's doing it with the Holy Ghost and fire. So you got to you gotta get in there and say, what does that mean? And they still baptized by water um, after Yeshua. Right. And, the, and, the, and, the, and that's what I'm saying. The water itself was the outward indication of what had already happened spiritually. That's the point. 
just like when we do communion. It's, it's an outward expression of what the work that Yeshua has already done in his body. So water baptism is the first act after having received the Holy Ruach. So where's the face? And that's what we got to ask us here. Where is the faith? Because the salvation come before the war. There's a lot. There's a lot of things that you touched on here, Elder, because even the 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 imagery, like for me, of thinking about, you know, the waters and how they're gonna flow out of the eternal city, and then trying to understand, you know, how that what that represents in the spirit. And, you know, when in certain scriptures they say that he was filled with the spirit. Like, you know, just drawing all those parallels, it, it's going to take a while to digest. So I'm definitely going to go back and check out that baptism. Yeah, I mean, so, and that's what I'm saying. So, uh, he, and he'll help help do it. But I understand that, the, you know, the water is a representation of the Holy Ghost. All right. So anybody got any revelations on who Carmi is? And we'll get out of here. Son of Reuben. All right, son of Reuben. So why is he being uh, reckoned under Judah? What happened here? I know there was an assimilation that took place where uh, Simeon, the tribe, amalgamated into Judah like the Levi's and Benjamin did. Could that have been it? Mm, close. Anybody else? If not, I'll go ahead and. All right. So when I was reading this, it kind of caught my attention because I'm knowing that, you know, I'm reading this and I'm knowing that Carmi is not a son of any other uh, of the children of Judah. And I'm saying, why is he being reckoned under, under Judah? And so I just did a little bit more digging or whatever. But Reuben uh, slept with one of his father's wives. All right. And so what happened was Reuben was first born and he lost his birthright. So when he lost his birthright, uh, you know, he lost. Um, let me see. I'm going to go back and pull that back up. He lost his birthright. And so uh, th that meant that the blessing would have to go somewhere else. And and his lineage would be um, also counted under someone else for a while. And so his lineage ended up being counted under uh, Judah and the birthright went to Joseph. So it says now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, this is in uh, first Chronicles five, of first one of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but for as much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, and the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. Then it goes on to say why he's under Judah. For Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler, but the birthright was Joseph. So his his lineage, uh, Reuben's lineage, was reconciled under Judah, but his birthright was given to Joseph, and that's why when we go to um, when we go to um, jo uh, Joseph, uh, Jacob giving um, Manasseh and uh, Ephraim blessings, he was giving them the blessing of Reuben. I hope that makes sense. They received the blessing or the, um, you know, uh, of the firstborn because Reuben lost his birthright. Elder, can I ask something? Okay. That that opened up a can of worms, right? Because when I look at what Reuben did to his father, um, it, it's likened on to what Ham did to his father. Well, Canaan. But yeah, but yeah, but he that's that's the point. Which I mean, he did it to Canaan. He cursed Canaan, but didn't curse Ham. But in this but instance, Ham didn't because, do it. Canaan did it. Can Ham didn't do anything. I thought I thought uh what he did to Noah he uh, No, it was Canaan that did it. 
the, the thing that Ham uh, messed up when he went and told his brothers, but he didn't actually perform anything against his father other than he didn't cover his father up. And his... Oh. I'm yeah, go, 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 go. Canaan, yeah, was, Canaan was the one with the offense, and that's why Canaan was cursed. Oh, because when Noah was directing it to the, the curses, he was telling Ham, yo, your your youngest son is gonna get it. So instead of him Noah talking to Canaan, he, he he talked to Ham through Canaan, or he talked to Canaan through Ham. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's that's too much to get into. All I'm saying is oh. that the that Canaan was cursed because of what he did. Not Ham was not cursed. Okay, if that's the case. Then I, I was trying to uh, like contrast the two, but then I guess that kind of put a monkey wrench in that. <laughs> Yeah, Ham was okay. not cursed. I, I digress. Yeah. All right. So that's uh, that's uh, it. We'll go ahead and uh, and I, I just saw a little note. I normally don't get to see the notes, but uh, let's keep Corey and his uh, wife in prayer, and uh, you know, continue to keep uh, Sylvia and her family in prayer. So let's just keep each other, all of us, lifted up. Mark, pray. Mark, uh, Marquise, keep getting stronger. Um. So, we we we've, we've got things to pray pray about. Uh, if I could uh add something to that, I'm actually so I, I was asking a question, and you were answering the question. You got towards the end of your uh response, and uh, my wife was calling. I tried to ignore the call real quick, and she called me right back. So obviously, I knew it was something wrong. Um, if we can just add in, my, I'm on the way home right now. My son um uh, is having some health complications as well. Um, found blood in his stool. So if we could add that to the list, that would be awesome. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, let's go ahead and pray then. Uh, Father, we just want to thank you for this day, this opportunity. We know that, uh, you know, it's in you that we live and move and have our very being, that you sit on the circle of earth. Heaven is your throne and earth is, is your footstool. <laughs> Father, we just know that you're in charge of all of these things and you've got everybody in sight right now. And Father, we add, you add a special blessing upon Jonathan, his son, touch them right now, Father, so, and, 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 and heal his son and, 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 and purify whatever it is that's going on right now, Father, uh, with them. Uh, give them the courage and give them the insight to do the things that they need to do to make sure uh, that your directions are followed. Father, we ask They're for a special, special blessing up on Corey and, and, and his family and, and, and his his wife and, and to touch her, Father, so that uh, yeah, she can get through this ordeal that she's going through. And Father, you know it's the, the pressure of, of being a care, caregiver, Father, is heavy. And we ask you to give him the strength that he needs, Father, in order to be able to do the things that he needs to do as the head of his household. But we also ask you for a special blessing with Lita and her family as she deal with uh, the consequences of health issues with her father. Father, we ask you to continue to be with them and others as well in the group, Father, that are dealing with all of these different things. So we ask you to be amongst us, help us that be trust you, uh, that all things are working for the good of us that love you and the call according to his purpose. To ask us, you help us to remember that you promised that you would never leave us, nor would you uh, forsake us, that you promised that you are a present help, uh, Father, in the time of trouble. Father, just help us to remember those things as we go through uh, these times. I ask you a special blessing upon a close family friend of mine that lost uh, you know, his sister, she was also a good friend of mine this week. Father, we ask a special blessing upon that family as they continue to uh, or go through their mourning processes and prepare uh, for the services as well. So we just want to thank you for being faithful and true and that you're our overseer and that you're not going to leave us, nor will you ever uh, forsake us. We just want to thank you in your son Yeshua's name we pray. Uh, amen. All right. Shalom. Shalom, everyone. Shalom. Shalom. Shalom, everyone. Shalom. Shalom.